ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया श्रीमद् भागवतम टेंथ कैंटो चैप्टर थर्टी फाइव वर्सेस एटीन एंड नाइनटीन द गोपी सिंह ऑफ कृष्णा मनी दारा का चिर अगायानम गा मनी दारा का चिर अगनायम गा मनी दारा का चिर अगनायम गा मालाया दाई थे गंदा तुलासिया Malaya dahite ganda tulasya ha. Prayani onu charasya kandam sehe. Praksipam pujam agayata yatra. Manidara kachit aganayam ga. Malhaya dahita ganda tulasya ha Prayani onu charasya kandam se Praksi panbujam agayati yatra Mani dara kachit aganayam ga Malaya Daita Ganda Tulasya Ha Pranayino Nu Charasya Kandam Se Praksi Pabujam Agayate Yatra
Kwa Nita Veno Rava Vanchita Chita Krishna Manavasata Krishna Grihiyaha Guna Gunarnam Agugatya Harin Yo Gopika Eva Vimukta Grihasaha Mani a string of gems, dara, holding, kvachit, somewhere, aganayam, counting, ka, the cows, malaya, with a flower garland, and dahita, of his beloved, ganda, having the fragrance, tulasya, the Tulasi flowers upon which Pranayina loving Anucharasya of a companion Kada at some time Amse on the shoulder Praksipan throwing Bujam his arm Agayata he sang Yatra when Kwadnita vibrated Venu of his flute Rava by the sound Vanchita stolen Chita their hearts Krishnam Krishna Anvasata they sat down beside Krishna of the black deer, Grihina, I'm sorry, Grihinya, the wives, Gunagana, of all transcendental qualities, Arnam, the ocean, Anugatya, approaching, Harinya, the does, Gopika, the gopis, Eva, just like Vimukta, having given up Griha for homes and family, Asa, their hopes. Hmm. Translation Now Krishna is standing somewhere counting his cows on the string of gems. He wears a garland of tulasi flowers that bear the fragrance of his beloved, and he has thrown his arm over the shoulder of an affectionate cowherd boy. As Krishna plays his flute and sings, the music attracts the black deer's wives who approach that ocean of transcendental qualities and sit down beside him, just like us cowherd girls. They have given up all hope for happiness in family life. Purport. Srila Jiva Goswami explains that in the afternoon Sri Krishna dressed himself in new clothing and then went out to call the cows home. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives the following information about the transcendental cows of Vrindavan. For each of the four colors of cows, white, red, black, and yellow, there are 25 subdivisions making a total of 100 colors. All such qualities are being colored like sandalwood pulp tilak, speckled, or having a head shaped like a murdanga drum, create eight further groups. To count these 108 groups of cows distinguished by color and form, Krishna is using a string of 108 jeweled beads. Thus when Krishna calls out, hey Dwali, the name of a white cow, a whole group of white cows come forward. And when he calls Hamsi, Chandini, Ganga, Mukta, and so on, the 24 other groups of white cows come. The reddish cows are called Aruni, Kunkuma, Saraswati, etc. The blackish ones, Shamala, Dulama, Jamuna, etc. And the yellowish ones, Pita, Pingala, Haritalika. 
those in the groups with tilak marks on their forehead are called chitrita, chitra tilaka, dirgda tilaka, and tiryak tilaka. And there are groups known as murdanga muki, murdanga head, simha muki, lion head, and so on. Thus being called by name, the cows are coming forward and Krishna thinking that when it's time to bring them back from the forest, none should be forgotten. He is counting them on his jeweled beads. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasiri Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Krishna, the gopis are speaking about Krishna's activities. They're singing a beautiful song describing Krishna's intimate loving relationships with his associates in Sri Vrindavan Dham. The description is so sweet and so intricate that they describe everything in detail. The garland that he wears is a Tulasi garden and they describe it in such a way that it has the fragrance of his beloved on the garland itself. He sings, he plays the flute, and the deer, their wives, are attracted by the sound. And then they come and sit beside him. And here, the cowherd girls, they start speaking about themselves. They have given up all happiness for family life. <clears throat> So one, when one can get attracted to Krishna, then everything in this world seems, and we say, a useless void. <laughs> when the conditioned soul is attracted to different things, and that attraction is long-term due to the association of matter. And to break that attraction means to be free from suffering. Because material attraction is the basis of material desire, which causes one to act against one's best interest. To fulfill material desire is like trying to <clears throat> fill a cup of water with the cup having so many holes in it at the same time. You're putting something in it, but nothing stays. It's like material desires. So here, these descriptions by the gopis themselves, who are so much absorbed in Krishna, that their love just pours over in such beautiful uh, literary embellishments of poetry and ornamentations, that they are actually expressing their own love for Krishna through these things, and, and their own desire to associate with Krishna. But Krishna, he mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, that his love is equal to all living entities. Samoham sarva bhuteshu name dvaisa priya. People don't understand this in this material world. They think God is partial by the way things happen, or he's partial by it according to different types of bodies. Srila Prabhupada was saying that Krishna's love is perfect, equal and eternal. Therefore, his love is always extended to all living beings. He doesn't discriminate between the types of bodies that the living entities have. Therefore, he can only be equal in all his loving relationships with his parts and parcels. That's the material world. But in the spiritual world, there's a certain extra added feature of his love that he shows intimacy in that loving relationship, that he's reciprocating with the cows in such a beautiful way that 
And Nanda Maharaj, we know, he's a, <clears throat> he's a gopa. And he has so many cows. He has 900,000 cows. When Srila Prabhupada describes this, he says, if you try to, try to understand that according to the geographical uh, measurement of the land of Vrindavan, you would think, how is it possible? Not only that, but pro Krishna has billions of cowherd friends also, and gopis of the same number. That's just a number to describe something that's unlimited. But in the spiritual, it's not that he's stacking them up one on top of the other so they can fit and they just go straight up, just like you see in the material world when they can't fit anything else in, they just go up, you know. It's in these big buildings, people on top of each other. <laughs> but in the spiritual realm, everything is natural, fits nicely, and there's room, plenty of room for more. <laughs> there's no limitation. <laughs> Because we can't perceive, due to our limited senses and minds and our conditioning, how spirit can co accommodate so many various groups of unlimited personalities in such a, what we say, a describable length of geography. Doesn't, doesn't make sense at all. But <clears throat> if spirit could be measured by matter, then matter would be equal to spirit. Therefore, spirit is always transcendental and not understandable through material calculations and understandings. That's why it's called a chintya. Now Krishna's love here is being expressed to the cows. <clears throat> He's counting each and every cow and he has japa beads. <laughs> we chant his name on the beads and he chants the names of the cows on the beads. <laughs> so if one returns to the spiritual world and has, and somehow or other gets the great benediction of becoming a cow, <laughs> one's eternal sarup, eternal mood of loving relationship, then Krishna is going to call you every day, <laughs> and on his beads, <clears throat> with great enthusiasm and great affection, and he doesn't forget one cow, and all the cows are eager, eager, and they're anticipating Krishna's call. So when he calls, like, hey, Dwavali, that's the name of a white cow. All the white cows think, oh, he's calling our group, so they all run forward. Because they're eager just to be, to hear the sound of Krishna's voice creates such attraction in their minds that they can't do anything else but run towards that voice. Everything about Krishna is all attractive. And his cows are very dear to Krishna. <clears throat> we, sometimes we go into the understanding how dear the cows are to Krishna. We just mentioned Krishna is equal to all. But it says in the Bhagavatam in various places that the cows, the brahmanas, women, children, and old people are by nature dependent on others for their livelihood and maintenance. And therefore, they are, in one sense, what we say, helpless. So, it says that out of the five, the most dear to Krishna, now this is, this might sound contradictory, how can some Krishna be equal, but at the same time, something be more dear? It says that the Brahmins and the cows are the, Krishna gives them what we say special attention because they're more dependent on Krishna than the other groups. And out of the two, the cows supersede the Brahmins. So Krishna, he's called Gobramani Hitaya Jagahitaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha. Govindaya. Govinda. One who gives pleasure to the cows, the land, and the senses. But Krishna has a particular name that is even distinct when it comes to the cow. He's called Gopal. Jayo, Gopal. He's Gopal. He has a particular name just for the cows, Gopal. 
So he gives his, he, he likes to be called Gopal, one who protects the cows. Pala means protection, one who gives protection to the cows. That protection is his love. And the cows are all living entities in Vrindavan are attracted to Krishna unlimitedly and constantly. <clears throat> it says that sometimes when the chow, cows are chewing on their grass and they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, they become stunned. The grass stops being chewed, the cows stand there motionless, and they look like wooden statues. <laughs> There's no movement. And if one were to be able to perceive that vision, they would think, that's not alive. It's not, can't be. <laughs> and Krishna's flute just stuns. And even the rivers, it says that when Krishna blows his fruit, the rivers reverse their direction, and then they make little swirls, and they go straight up in the air and dancing in ecstasy to hear the sound of Krishna's flute. The birds fall out of the trees. <laughs> The trees itself can turn in direction of the sound of the flute. So Krishna's flute attracts everything. It says that if one could hear the sound of the universe, there's an ultimate principle of sound within the universe, and that is Krishna's flute. Some people say it's the sound of the Gayatri Mantra. That sound is so subtle, but it's Krishna playing his flute, and what is he doing? He's doing the same thing that he's doing in the spiritual world. All living entities are being attracted by his flute. And what is that attraction? Uh, that it's so sweet and so irresistible that no one can consider going on with material life. Now that's a problem. That could be a problem. If you, if you get so attracted to Krishna that you look around and you look at your wife, your husband, your kids, your possessions, your everything, you think, who needs it? <laughs> Do we want to come to that stage? That's scary, isn't it? <laughs> For some of us, it could be a little scary, right? And some people think, well, you know, I don't want to be too Krishna conscious because that what's, might be what happens. Then I have to kind of... And it says here, the cowherd girls, they say, uh, just like us cowherd girls, we have given up all hope for happiness in family life. So whatever happiness one is still somewhat dependent on for their activities in this world becomes useless. But that's not a benediction everybody wants, right? It's a little scary. You know? Take Krishna is going to take everything. Yeah, Krishna can take everything away, but he can't do it all at once. That's not fair. He has to do it in increments. This is a uh, this is a program of installments. I'll surrender in installments, right? My first installment is I'll chant your Hari, the holy names, the second installments, and I'll, I'll read the books, and I'll even do some service, third installments, but, you know, don't go too far, Krishna. You know, it's a, it's a little dangerous there. There's certain things that, you know, I have really worked hard for all my life, and, and you know I still love you, but, you know. <laughs> so be, so Krishna, somehow or other, but here, if you were to hear a sound of Krishna's flute, just like the cows, and he explains that actually that one beautiful pastime in the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, when Lord Brahma stole all the cows and cowherd boys, Krishna remanifested that the same forms exactly according to their natures, colors, idiosyncrasies, personalities, gestures, every aspect of their existence was remanifested by Krishna in such a way that no one could tell the difference between the actual originals and the incarnations of Krishna who assumed these various forms. And the cows, when they saw their calves, who were actually Krishna himself in the form of their own calves, they ran so fast that they broke away from the hold of the cowherd men 
And the cowherd men were thinking, what's happening? I never, we never saw the cows act so erratically. And they just start charging towards their calves and they were licking their calves and offering the calves milk. And even some of the cows who, who already dried up were giving milk. <laughs> because their calves were so lovable, they actually were Krishna himself, that they could only just pour out their love in the form of their milk. So Krishna can, Krishna will, we want that. We pray, my dear Lord, please attract me away from this material energy. I still see something important or something attractive in this material energy. But if Krishna sends you special mercy, as Prabhupada used to say himself, if Krishna wants to favor you, he gives you everything. But if Krishna wants to really favor you, he takes everything away. Prabhupada said, he just what he did to me. He took everything away. And then you're left with just Krishna. Hari <laughs> And so we, we think, well, all right, I want to come to that stage, but I want to be ready for it. But you'll never be ready for it. <laughs> it has to happen according to Krishna's arrangement. And then when it happens according to Krishna's arrangement, just like we see that even Srila Prabhupada, I mean, we don't, Prabhupada is a nitya siddha. He came into this world to perform the activities of reclaiming the fallen souls as a representative of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His, his prediction in this world was, was mentioned in the Shastras. It was even spoken by Krishna to Ganga Devi 5,000 years ago. There are many indications of Prabhupada's appearance in this world by Krishna, by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and by Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. There was at least three different Shastric predictions. But we see in the life of Srila Prabhupada that he was a grihasta and he had some children. He was very dedicated to his spiritual master. But at one time, his spiritual master decided to you know, appear to Srila Prabhupada in the dream and said, take sannyas. And that, of course, was after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had disappeared from the planet. And Srila Prabhupada, he was so, as he said, mortified <laughs> that he went immediately in the middle of the night to his godbrother, Sridhar Swami, and wanted to speak about the dream he had with, with, Bhakti, with uh, his spiritual master. And uh, that was once, that was the first time. The second time, it happened again. It happened twice. And Prabhupada said, I have to give up my family. I have to give up my everything. But then later, he, later he said he was so thankful for that. He was very thankful for that because he said, later now I have a big family without the botheration of a wife. So he was thanking Krishna for that. Just recently I read one god brother also had a similar situation. He writes about it in a Vyasa Puja offering this year to Srila Prabhupada, where Srila Prabhupada appeared to him in a dream and told him to take sannyas. The same thing that happened to Prabhupada. And he was married for more than 25 years. He had a nice family. The marriage was very Krishna conscious. Everything was nice. And he was a very successful preacher within the Grihastha Ashram, his wife also. But when he, heard, when he got that dream, he was also shocked. <laughs> As Prabhupada had shocked, was shocked by his spiritual master. And uh, Prabhupada talked to him in the dream and he, he asked Prabhupada, you know, I have to give up everything? Prabhupada said, you're a great preacher. You can actually do wonders spreading Krishna consciousness. And the sannyasa ashram will give you more advantage. So Prabhupada was pushing him and finally, he accepted, and he writes about it, but initially it was very difficult to accept that instruction. Extremely difficult. So, but when the spiritual master calls, or Krishna calls us through the spiritual master, 
then the devotee thinks how to do it, not why should I do it, but how to do it. So that's the mercy of the Lord. We pray not to become attracted or lose attracted for anything in this material world. Because everything in this material world is extraneous or what we say superfluous to the soul. The soul cannot be happy with anything in this material world. Things in this material world support our existence on the bodily and, and mental platform, but they're not the source of happiness, <laughs> nor are they a source of success in life. Therefore, the mercy of the Lord coming through the association of the Vaishnavas and engagement in devotional service purifies our, our consciousness from all these attractions to the material energy. And then the devotee wants only Krishna to serve Krishna. That's all. That's the residence of Vrindavan. There's no question of them not serving Krishna. But the loving relationship between Krishna and the devotees are so sweet, so deep, and so full of variegatedness that it's, it says one of the names of Krishna is Gopi Vallabha. That's one of his names, Gopi Vallabha. And the Acharyas translate the name Gopi Vallabha as one who gives newer and newer pleasure to the gopis. Not only pleasure to the gopis, but newer and more variety forms of pleasure. So transcendental pleasure is not static. This material happiness is, is limited and always static. It goes to a certain level of, what we say, uh, satisfaction and then reverses itself down to misery. That's the nature of everything in this material world. I was just reading some statement by Krishna. It's written somewhere. Bhaktivinoda Thakur quotes the statement in one of his writings. Where he's, Krishna is speaking, he said that the miseries in this material world, I created that. Now, I didn't do that just to give you a difficulty or make you suffer. I did that simply to so you wouldn't want to stay in this place. <laughs> just so you could give up the desire to try to find satisfaction or permanency in this material world. So that's Krishna's mercy. When he takes everything away and when he, he presents a situation where we have to leave, you know, our attractions and attachments in this material world. And that's, we see many times we're given that opportunity. Are we going to take Krishna or are we going to take Maya? And every time we take Maya, it becomes harder in our Krishna consciousness. And every time we take Krishna, Become, Krishna opens up his mercy more and more to the devotee. What is that mercy? He gives more and more unlimited opportunities for service and for association. Krishna is very difficult. We read the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how he went into ecstasy thinking about Krishna when he was in the moods of, of Sri Vrindavan Dham. He went, he went into internal consciousness and how in the mood of separation, longing for and trying to associate with Krishna, <clears throat> and when his devotees would break him out of these trances of ecstasy, seeing that his body was such in a deformed condition due to the ecstasies, he would become un unhappy and angry. <clears throat> but at the same time, it appeared that in that he failed, not failed, but his ecstasy of love fell short to the complete satisfaction. But that's the ecstasy of separation. So that's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching. That Krishna takes us into the mood of separation. Prabhupada said, Krishna is always one step ahead of you. At least one, maybe more than that. The whole process of bhakti is to chase after Krishna. And the whole process of bhakti is that you never catch him. Haribo. <laughs> he stops for some time, gets caught, and then he leaves again. 
Why does he do that? Just to, just to attract your love even more. Because those who have meager devotion, then when Krishna comes and then they leave, they feel, uh, they go back down. But those who understand that the, that the happiness that comes or the satisfaction that comes with full surrender to the Lord will never stop chasing Krishna no matter what. It's, it's a useless affair. You can't catch him. <laughs> he just, he's so fast. And we can't run that fast, especially. But he's merciful that he stops once in a while, gets caught, and then runs away again. That's Krishna. That's his love. That's his mercy. Because the mood of separation, there's a nice statement by Srimati Radharani herself where she's asked, are you, are you more happy when you're with Krishna or when you're separated from Krishna? So Radharani's response is, when I'm with Krishna, there's one Krishna. When I'm separated from him, there are, I see Krishna everywhere. <laughs> there's so many Krishnas. So the ecstasy of separation continues to pull the heartstrings in such a way that the devotee always wants to associate with Krishna. But in the ecstasy of separation, that association comes through the mood of longing. Through the mood. Even the gopis, although they want to be with Krishna, when they're with Krishna, they think, oh, we're with Krishna, but he's going to leave again. So they can't be happy being with Krishna because they're in anxiety because he's going to leave again. So it's a useless affair. Sounds like it. <laughs> Spiritual, it says that love of God is a combination of five different ingredients which are all very sweet and nectarian, but there's a little tinge of black pepper in there just to give it some spice, some, what we say, some difficulty. <laughs> it's mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita. There's five ingredients that make up love of God. And one of them is black pepper. <laughs> so it's like a chutney. Krishna is like a chutney. So hot, you can't take him. At the same time, so sweet, you can't give him up. <laughs> So what is the hotness? He's just, he's just ripping away all of our attachments in this material world. And here the cows are just so eager. To, to, they wait to hear that sound. And when they hear that sound, they come. And Krishna calls each cow by each name. He knows each of the cows. He knows their colors. He knows their uh, different personalities, each of the cows have their own individual unique personalities. And there's different kinds of cows, there's Murdunga head cows, there's lion head cows, there's tilak cows with tilak markings on their foreheads, natural tilak. There are white cows and red cows and speckled cows and black cows and yellow cows. I remember we were at New Vrindavan. This was back in the old days. Uh, we, in the very beginning days when the New Vrindavan community was just started, mm -hmm. Prabhupada said cow protection. That was one of the features of New Vrindavan. So there was an, you know, a plan to get more and more cows. So at the beginning, we had four cows. That was the first, we had four cows for a while. And then there was a letter written to Srila Prabhupada. Radhanath Maharaj describes this story in detail. Wherein the devotees are asking Prabhupada to give names for the cows. And Prabhupada writes back a letter and says, Chintamani. No, sorry, Sarabi, that's right, Sarabi. 
So Rab, Prabhupada wrote back one name, Surabi. So we had four cows. We thought, well, maybe Prabhupada didn't understand we have four cows. So he wrote another letter, and Prabhupada wrote back, Surabi 1, Surabi 2, <laughs> Surabi 3, Surabi 4. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> Surabi. We had one cow, her name was Duja. Oh, she was a real rascal. <laughs> she would give her milk and then turn around and try to drink it. <laughs> She was real feisty. Oh. I remember in the different cows, and the cowherd boys would call the cows, and they, ooh, 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 ooh. We call the cows like that. And the cows would come running down the hill from the pastures into the barn for milking like that. In the old days, we had, at least when I was there, up until the middle 70s, around 1975, 76, we had about, oh, a couple hundred cows. But when I was there in the 80s, we had over 500 cows. With so many. It became a little hard to maintain that many cows after a while. But it was nice. We would go right after Bhagavatam class and we would be encouraged to go out and see the cows right just before breakfast. We would go out and see the cows and pet the cows and you know, give the feed them some hay like that and just be with the cows for a few minutes, maybe a half hour. And then we would go for breakfast. We did that every day. That was a regular to go out to see the cows. And then the barn was moved. After the, the cows became many, the barn was rebuilt and moved in a different place. And then it was a mile away from the temple. So then it was a problem <coughs> to see the cows. And later on, someone decided to build another barn to bring back the old mood and keep a few cows near the temple. So then we started to see the, do the, cows, see the cows again after breakfast. So wherever there's cows, everything is auspicious. <laughs> it says that the modern civilization, they've given up cows and they take cars instead, right? Car protection, right? <laughs> <laughs> the ecstasy of four wheels, right? Instead of, you know, four hooves. So that, that's unfortunate. Society has become advanced so much so that the, the aesthetic, moral, and spiritual values of society has pushed out the most dear animal to Krishna, Krishna's cows. Mm. So here we hear all the names of the cows and Krishna's pastimes with the cows. Okay, so any questions? Comments? Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Go to Primanandi Hari Hari Bo.